So Justin, uh, I've got this massive helicopter here that you've brought along. Um, it's pretty impressive, but what physics can we look at when we look at something like this? Okay, so a question I always had from uh, watching war films like Black Hawk Down with helicopters in, yep. uh, which is great, the tail rotor would often get missiled um, out of commission, that might get blown off, yep. and whenever that happened, the helicopter would suddenly start doing a little death spiral uh, before eventually crashing. And I was wondering, why, why does that happen? Is that Hollywood physics or is it real physics? Okay, so is this something that's kind of part of the course that people are learning at school? Is there, There's not really a module on helicopter crashes and why we need a tail rotor. Not, not a specific module on helicopters, but if I was teaching the engineering course of AQA, that okay. optional module, yep. uh, then that would include things like learning about angular momentum. Mm -hmm. And then this demo... Uh, would fit straight into that part of the course. Cool, okay, so um, for students who are taking AQA for A-level, which is a lot of people, a lot of people do the engineering uh, module, which I've taught myself as well, and I really liked it. It was uh, looking at, I suppose, the relationship between linear dynamics, so SUVAC questions, and then it built up to rotational dynamics, which was probably a little bit different to anything that people had done before, but the mathematics was quite similar. There's also stuff about heat engines, which got a little bit more complicated. But yep. uh, but yeah, so um, rotational dynamics, so not just circular motion, but things maybe accelerating in that uh, radial yeah. path or maybe decelerating or torque and things like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it brings it to life a lot more than just the classic, I, I'm an ice skater and I've got my arms out and I bring them together and what happens there. And I think that's what most people remember. If, if they ever hear about angular momentum, they know it's conserved, but they don't really actually understand the, the kind of the mathematical parts behind the physics do they yeah so here's the question for you and if you get this right and you sign up to my uh, tuition course uh, I will send you some bonus resources so as I rotate uh, the main rotor uh, which direction should the tail rotor rotate in so imagine that if it is rotating uh, clockwise uh, it is pushing the air towards the camera and if it is rotating anti-clockwise it's pushing the air away from the camera. And I've just blurred this out so you can't see what the actual answer is. It's definitely going to involve forces. And when we think about forces, uh, what name springs to mind? Uh, we've got lift, definitely. The name of a person. Oh, OK. So if we're thinking about forces, um, I guess we're going to think about Newton. Of course. Let's, let's talk a little bit about Newton. So as much as the engineering physics is great, my favourite optional module from the AQA when I was teaching it uh, was the turning point module. Yeah. But I couldn't find many good resources. So mm -hmm. the turning points basically attempted to answer three questions. It's not all about moments. Mm -hmm. It's about moments in time. Uh, what is light? How do we know how fast it travels? How can we measure the speed of light? Does it have a speed? Is it infinitely fast? Does it come out of your eyes like the ancient Greeks uh, believed? Mm -hmm. um, or does it enter the eyes? Does it travel in straight lines? What properties does it have? Is it a wave? Is it a particle? If it's a wave, what medium is it traveling through? What's actually doing the waving? Mm -hmm. uh, lots of great questions about that. And then there was the discovery of the electron. Yeah. So I'm sure many students are frustrated when they're drawing the current, the conventional current going from positive to negative in a circuit, but then you zoom in and the things that are moving, the electrons, are actually moving in the opposite direction. The electron was discovered over 100 years after people were playing around with electric circuits. Mm -hmm. And uh, special relativity, yep. which is amazing because all you need to do is understand Pythagoras' theorem in order to derive these equations that blow your mind. Yeah. So in order to you know find resources for that, I ended up making my own resources. And over the course of 11 years, my teaching career, these have snowballed into what I call the history of science lectures. OK. So we're not just going to talk about Newton then. I guess there's many scientists from all different backgrounds that have been involved in the kind of journey of physics so far. Indeed. So if you have a look at the core structure, uh, you'll see the second history of science is all about Isaac Newton. Yeah. Uh, here I've got a textbook from Edexcel, 
and there's actually a picture of Newton. You'll probably find a picture of Newton in any textbook. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, Sir Isaac Newton was an ex exceptional thinker and scientist. His influence over science in the West is still enormous, despite the fact he lived from 1642 to 1727. Uh, he was a professor at Cambridge University, a member of the British Parliament, and a president in the respective scientific organisation, the Royal Society in London. Probably his most famous contribution to science was the development of three simple laws governing the movement of objects subject to forces. So pretty important guy, I guess, at the time and in history. But there's a reason why there's not a massive history of Newton in that book, because this is very much a textbook. This one in particular is a good book. It kind of uh, has the information that students need to answer exam questions for the exam. But that's not the end of it, is it? No. So everyone thinks of Newton as this great scientist, a mathematician who invented calculus, although Leibniz actually invented calculus at kind of the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, but to settle the debate, he asked the Royal Society um, to come, come and decide. And of course, he's president of the Royal Society at the time. Yeah. So you guys are now in charge of deciding who gets credit, Leibniz or me, your president. Mm. Um, so he, he was very much a dangerous president. Yeah. Uh, he stole a lot of things um, and credit. So he had lots of enemies. So Robert Hooke is probably his biggest enemy. Yeah. Um, and if you look at Robert Hooke, you'll probably find a portrait where he looks a bit like a witch-pirate hybrid. And the tale goes that Newton, um, he was working for the Treasury and the Crown as well, and mm -hmm. the Royal Mint uh, at the Bank of London, um, the rent was too high in central London and the Royal Society was spending loads of money and they published the history of fishes one year and basically it was an absolute flop and they didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So he decided I'm going to relocate to the outskirts of London. Yeah. And in the relocation, uh, they moved everything except for Robert Hooke's uh, laboratory and he'd been working there for about 40 years. Mm -hmm. And then that burnt down, including his only portrait. So when a new portrait was commissioned, I wonder who they asked to describe the appearance of Robert Hooke. Somebody who knew him well, somebody who was a big rival perhaps. Yeah. Just speculation, but I like to believe that's true. Another thing about Newton, uh, he actually wrote more about the occult and religion than he did on maths and science. He okay. was a bit of a crazy character, but nobody talks about that. And is that why there are seven colours of light? Is that a, is this a bit of an urban myth about that was his lucky number? So he assigned seven colours. So he, I guess he split purple into lilac and or violet and indigo. So the prism thing is something that he did actually do. Okay. And, and he can have credit for that. Although this is what led to the rivalry with Hook when he sent it into the Royal Society. Yeah. Basically, Hook didn't give him the credit for this. Okay. And th there's whole stories about this, and it's, it's great to get into. It's great fun. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that one about whether the seven yeah. uh, is there, so that's something that I'm going to have to go and look up, and if it's true... Maybe I've taught generations of, of students the wrong thing, but there's definitely... there's a, You know, seven is like a sort of lucky number in many, many things, or yeah. maybe a number to... Yeah. <laughs> um, so these textbooks... You know, they're written to go with the syllabus, but also the syllabus or the specification will tell you that you need to understand the scientific method and how science works. And it seems like you're supposed to just absorb that by osmosis almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in these lectures, it explicitly goes through how we know what we know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now we're into kind of like the 17th century. Um all of a sudden, we know Newton's three laws of motion. What did people think before then? If you go back to ancient Greece, Aristotle believed that heavy objects fall faster. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, you might have a hammer and a feather and you drop them side by side. We all know what's going to happen. Yeah. The hammer falls faster. Mm -hmm. Why? That's what they used to ask in, uh, as philosophers. Yeah. Because it's heavier, of course. Mm -hmm. And that was job done. He would go and, you know, to the steps of the Agora, the marketplace, and basically just preach, I have knowledge for you. Heavy objects fall faster. Why? Because they're heavier. Yeah. And then um, just before uh, Newton was born, actually the same year Newton was born, this person died mm -hmm. um, around Pisa. Who am I talking about? 
Oh, it's Galileo, isn't it? It's got to be Galileo, indeed. So there's a you know story about Galileo going up to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropping cannonballs, one a lead one, one a brass one. So the same size but different masses. Yeah. And, of course, this story is just a thought experiment because he's been put under house arrest mm -hmm. by the church for saying that the Earth is not the centre of the universe. Yeah. Um, which, of course, everybody believed it must be because of religion and gods. If you're Romans or Greek, yeah. you've got multiple gods. But, mm -hmm. you know, we're special. Uh, we can comprehend things. We're at the centre of the universe. The Earth isn't moving. The orbits are a little bit weird. It would be nice if everything was going around in perfect circles. Mm -hmm. But some of the planets, they start moving in a circle and then over time they stop and move backwards for a little bit before continuing on. This is called retrograde motion. And the likes of uh, Ptolemy, you may have heard of the Ptolemaic yeah. model of the solar system, he started having these weird planets who were doing this, moving around in circles on a big circle, and these were called epicycles and deference, and the maths worked out. But Copernicus realised that it's a lot easier if everything's orbiting the sun. Mm -hmm. But he was too scared to publish because he was religious as well. Yeah. Um, but it was only Galileo who then agreed with Copernicus and said, well, yeah, this is, this is what it is, and I'm not going to recant my beliefs because these beliefs are perfectly sensible. Uh, but the church is saying, well... If the Earth is moving, you'd feel it. If you get on the mm -hmm. train and the train starts to move, you know the train's moving. But the Earth doesn't seem to be moving. Mm. So there was a whole debate about this at the time, uh, which is why I couldn't do that thought experiment. But you don't get any of this in the textbook. No. So these lectures will go into these kind of moments in history all the way from ancient Greece. Uh, I might go towards kind of gravitational waves in 2017 mm -hmm. if I get onto the sixth lecture at some stage. Um, but it talks about the people, their theories. Most of the time they're crazy theories. So while we remember Newton for all of his good stuff, he's done a lot of bad stuff, not just stealing things as well. Um, so the key experiments, so the difference between philosophy yeah. and science is science makes predictions that are testable. Mm -hmm. And then you do these tests and you realise that, ah, I'm wrong. And now it can evolve. And this is the whole point of how science works. It's a coupling between theory and experiment. Yeah. And the scientific method hasn't been around for that long. It's only around Galileo, Descartes, Francis Bacon, that kind of period that the scientific method was truly established. It was established a little bit uh, before that by the likes of Al-Haytham. Uh, I don't think an Arab will be mentioned in any of these textbooks. I don't remember seeing any names apart from it tends to be sort of middle class white men from uh, a particular period in history and they're the ones who are that we name the units after, like the Jules, the Newtons, all of those things. So um, for students who maybe want to find out a bit more about this, you're doing a course, uh, it's aimed at Year 12 students? Yes, so I'm going to attempt to revise all of Year 12 uh, in 12 weeks, so over the course of about 30 hours. Yeah. So obviously the textbook content, because that's essential, I'm going to throw in uh, some exam tips, some revision tips as well with my examiner's hat on yeah um, and I'm going to actually teach you how science works by giving you the context behind all of these facts that are just given to you in the textbook that's fantastic and if you want to find out more about that then you can find details in the description below and I'm sure you're going to talk then about which way the rotor would turn in order to stop the helicopter spinning and those kind of physics principles yeah, we'll find, that, find out the answers in that course. Brilliant. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Lewis.